So welcome Megan to the Lisa podcast. On the podcast we talk about all things addiction. So just give me a bit of a background of how you sort of got here and what your journey's been like. Well, I suppose it's been about uh, 20 years of pretty active addiction, uh, probably five, six, seven rehabs. And, um, you know, finally getting to that place where you're just done and really wanting to, you know, sort of spin that, that straw into gold by by writing a blog about it and in a very open format, I just believe that the stigma around this needs to change and that the only way to do that is to be the a way shore, shower, you know, to sort of model that um, in our vulnerabilities and our foibles and shortcomings and just sheer embarrassment, you know, that there is a, there is an alchemical process that happens there where you actually shift and become something different and, or rather more of who you really are. And so I don't know, I just started writing about it and, um, it seems to have gotten a good response so far. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've read the blog and I found you from medium and message you and I think it's really good. And I thought some of the posts were yeah really interesting. Um, in terms of, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just, I love Medium. And Medium is such a cool platform. I mean, we never would have found each other without it. It's something like the 256 most popular website in the world. And I've been writing for a month and I have really close to a thousand followers. So that's pretty incredible. You know, if I were just blogging about my cat on some random website, I probably wouldn't have that uh, readership. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think Medium's awesome. And obviously I've set up like a publication so that people can read about the podcast episodes, they can listen to them or they can watch them as well, all in that one sort of like blog post, if that makes sense. So it makes it really easy to like share information and capitalize it. And you don't have to build a website or deal with like traffic or all of that stuff. Yeah. Say that again, you don't have to deal with what? With like traffic or building like, yeah, building your traffic basically. Yeah, yeah, I'm actually just launching my website too, and I'm, I want to do the two concurrently, you know. Um, yeah, it's all just a grand experiment to me. <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting to see which one is like people prefer and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you said medium is nice as in play, you know. Yeah, but you said you've been to like five rehabs. Um, how was that mm-hmm. sort of process? <laughs> Well, I kind of got, I sort of started to feel like a, um, like a, a rehab winner. I mean, people think of rehab as the ultimate, the ultimate fuck up, but I got really, really good at, um, at being the patient, you know, and being, uh, on the receiving side of all of this information and knowledge. And, um, at the, the last one I went to was a really good one. I, I really felt like it was more of a, a spiritual retreat in a sense. And, um, I took the time that I was there to really just go within. I started meditating. I read some really good books. I read Tommy Rosen's recovery 2.0. I read, uh, Gabor Mate's the realm of the hungry ghosts. And both of those books were highly transformational, um, for, for my situation. I just, it was like the light went on, you know, and I started to look at, I'd always sort of kind of grappled with the idea of recovery as this holistic thing. And, um, that really brought it home for me. Um, you know, and then of course rehab is like filled with the most interesting characters that you would, you know, that you would never cross paths with at any other time in your life. Um, it's just the most interesting cross section of socioeconomic, you know, um, variety and, uh, I can remember this one. I I mean, one character who stands out, uh, she was a transgender person and I, I got to hear, you know, her stories about what it was like to be thrown in jail and like how they treat transgender people in jail. And they really, they don't know how to handle them. So they put them in with the rapists and the murderers and just the, the stories that, that came out of that, you know, that's, that's an extreme example, but the, you know, it's, there's a lot of characters in there and some of them are very smart. Some of them are highly manipulative, skilled, 
liars and cons and it's just uh it's an it's an education really on people yeah and how do you feel all of those people you're around contributed to your growth um you know i think that it is very much a, a like a we situation you know i i probably contributed to theirs i you know there were times that i would feel really triggered because you're in such close quarters with people. Um, there were times I'd feel super annoyed with people in there. And um, it was just, you know, it's like, it's, it's this kind of co-creative thing that happens. I mean, you, I, I kind of think that the people that you end up there with, it's like almost meant to be in a way. It's sort of like you have this, maybe like a soul agreement to show up at that time with those people and go through that experience. And, you know, interesting little miracles happen. Yeah, it sounds really interesting. And you said earlier that you read some books that helped you sort of, I guess, reframe your mind in a sense. What other stuff would you say helped you sort of get over your addiction this time? Well, I, I, it's been an interesting um, dichotomy for me because I've always been on a spiritual path, probably as long as I've been drinking and doing drugs. I've also been consuming uh, spiritual material. And I definitely, you know, early on um, when I tried to get sober, like in my early 20s, there was, you know, the big book talks about um, a lot of things that I like that I couldn't really resonating with, for example, being, being spiritually bankrupt. And I was like, that's just not true for me. I always, my spirituality was always very accessible to me. But, um, as the years went on and my addiction worsened, I did become spiritually bankrupt. I mean, there was a point I would say probably, you know, five to seven years ago where I was like, I just don't even know if there's a God. Like I, 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 I it was the first time in my life I had ever said that. And, um, so I, like I was saying, it's just this interesting dichotomy between dark and light. You know, I, I was like really in the darkness, being in the throes of abject addiction. It's it's a horrible thing to experience. And then I could always recover and bounce back and go into my, you know, go on a deep meditation retreat for a week or a month or whatever. And and then as time went on, it was like it just became like the darkness kind of won. The darkness was taking over and I had to kind of like fight this this battle to get get back into the light. Uh, and how was that journey of being like in the balance, if you like, between the darkness and the light? I mean, I think it's like, I, when I look back at it, I think it's the kind of like the hero's journey, you know, what Joseph Campbell talks about with the hero's journey. It's like something that we all go through. Uh, anybody who is striving to become awake must go through some version of the hero's journey through some dark night of the soul. You know, mine happened to be with drugs and alcohol, but any of my friends or people that I know who are on the path of seeking to, you know, wake up to help the planet wake up to heal this planet. Cause we're obviously in complete total crisis. Um, every single one of them has gone through some, some version of that, you know, it's just what the flavor, the flavor varies. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I guess I sort of went through the same process as well, the weight in between like the light and the darkness and then choosing sort of the light when the darkness got too much to bear, if that makes sense. And then, yeah, choosing to go forwards and, yeah, sort of show anything like and complete my hero's journey. And now I'm obviously doing the podcast and I'm training to become a counsellor. And it's interesting, like you say, uh-huh. everyone kind of has those those journeys. And that's awesome. I mean, and see, it's such a beautiful thing that what you went through, you, you're now turning that around so that you can share, you know, your journey and your story and be of service to others. I mean, otherwise, what's the point of having gone through all that darkness? You know, it, it's like it, it was futile. It was pointless. It was it was like, why go through all that suffering if you're not going to turn it around and be of service in some way? Yeah, I think that's really, like, a beautiful idea for your life as well. But in terms of, like, we've never really had anyone on the podcast that spoke about, like, the 12 steps. Did you work on the 12 steps in rehab? How did you find that sort of version of recovery, if that makes sense? I mean, so there's, like, this, you know, most rehabs, um, they just, they have this very, like, 
cut and dry kind of uh, formula that they give you. They put you on, um, you know, they put everyone on antidepressants. They give you something to sleep. They take you to AA meetings. They have group meetings um, at the house. They give you chores. You know, there's just this like formula. Um, and, you know, um, when I was in my early 20s, I was able to move through um, some of the 12 steps, most of the 12 steps. And yet I never completed them. I, um, I always only got to about, you know, six months of sobriety. That was always my upper limit and probably like that, you know, the ninth step or something like that. Um, and then I spent a lot of years rejecting the 12 steps. I found all of the reasons that why it wasn't true, why I didn't agree with it. it. I was, I was better than the 12 steps. I was more spiritually savvy than the 12 steps. Um, and what I like to say is that it was it, what I was trying to do was like get a PhD in spirituality without studying my ABCs. That's what the that's what the twelve steps are. They're the ABCs. They're the foundation, and you cannot build anything without a strong, firm foundation. So uh, I, you know, I'm now doing um, sort of the tenth, eleventh, and twelfth steps. Really, I'm on the tenth step which is about taking a daily inventory <clears throat> where, um, you know, basically the thing that causes us to drink and use are our resentments. And like any human being, we naturally, um, we, we naturally accrue resentments. And if you go, if you on a day to day basis, you kind of clean up that resentment and all that you're doing is doing a turnaround and finding your part. Like how did you create that resentment? Right? Because nothing in our lives happens to us by happenstance. We're not victims. Like, we're here co-creating our reality with all the other people around us. So it's always about <clears throat> finding our part. And there's this beautiful freedom that happens when you, when you find your part, you know, you're, if, you're, if I'm, if I'm mad at someone, it's because they did something. But if upon closer examination, I can find how I created that circumstance, then there's like this, this weight that gets lifted. Right. And I'm le and if I can do that on a daily basis, then I'm much less likely to relapse. You know, I'm much less likely to, because we drink and use because we're uncomfortable. You know, when I think back on all the years I spent drinking and drugging, um, I was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable in my own skin. You know, I was uncomfortable with my thoughts and my feelings. And so the goal here is to just have some peace of mind, um, to have some peace in my heart and to be feeling, you know, more or less happy. <laughs> um, I think I answered your question. I, I also just wanted to add that I've never been sober um, as long as I have now. I have like eight and a half months or something like that. <laughs> My daughter's over there making noise. Oh, sure. oh, sure. um, so, yeah. I've, the most time I have now, I'm on the 10th step and, you know, I'll – continue to work the steps I see the uh the wisdom and the beauty um and the right living that's really what the 12 steps offer is a way of right living you know and I think that anybody could do the 12 steps you don't have to be an addict or an alcoholic um even though you know upon closer examination it seems that you know society-wide we do have this endemic situation of addiction whether it's technology porn shopping you know Everyone's addicted to something, so everyone could benefit from the 12 steps. <laughs> yeah, awesome. And how would you say, like, meditation plays into your recovery? It's huge. And, you know, I go through periods where I meditate more, and um, I'm getting I'm, – I'm, I just have to say I'm, like, getting a little bit better at it, you know. It's uh, I have an active mind, and it's constantly running and telling me stories, and – it's nice to be able to just drop in and tap into source and feel that peace. Um, I definitely could strengthen that muscle. There's an app I like to use called Insight Timer that takes me through guided meditations and any type of little tools or hacks like that that you know we can we can use to help us on our journey are just great. <laughs> yeah, I guess I've found in my journey that if you can sort of understand you are not your thoughts and disassociate from that then it's a lot easier to sort of manage cravings and manage your addictive tendencies 
to be able to sort of say, look, although I'm having this thought, it doesn't equal a choice or decision. You know, there's a separation there. Um, and I think that's been really useful for me, certainly. The very act of observing it, you know, you who who is the observer? What is it that's observing that that thought? It's 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 the observer. You know, it does create that that separation. Yeah, yeah, I think that's interesting. If you say like you've had the twelve steps and we've got the meditation, which also helps, how would you say like your emotions or trauma have like been involved in your recovery? How have you sort of have you had any sort of would you say trauma to deal with? How did you get over that? How did that side of it work? Did I did I have any something to deal with? I didn't understand. Any like trauma or like emotional trauma? Um, oh yeah, <clears throat> definitely, definitely drank and used because of childhood trauma. Um, and you know, I'm I've always been a pretty emotional person, and I don't know if I'm just more shut down these days or if I've reached a certain level of maturity or if I finally just done enough work on myself that I'm not so totally run by my emotions, um, anymore. And, you know, one of the questions I've always struggled with about, um, alcoholics is like, well, you know, was I born this way? Is that really true? Is it really a disease or was it, is it nature versus nurture, nature versus nurture? And I just always turn this over in my head and try to understand the answer. And it, I mean, as it turns out, I believe it's, it's truly, it's truly both. You know, I think we're, we're born with certain tendencies or propensities and then the environment that we're in can either <clears throat> heighten or, you know, or just add to that, <clears throat> make it, make it more so. And, um, I think it's a lifetime, you know, it's, it's like a lifetime of, of unraveling where all of us are traumatized as children. And it's just to the degree that it happened. Um, you know, Gabor Mate in his book, uh, The Realm of the Hungry Ghost, he's been a doctor for 30 years. And he does these case studies where he looks, takes the most down and out intravenous drug users in Vancouver and finds this, con you know, after 30 years, he starts to notice these patterns. And all of them, <clears throat> the ones that are shooting cocaine and heroin, um, all of them were, were severely abused as children. All of them were ra raped. All of them were just horribly, horribly mistreated. And that, you know, they were probably sensitive individuals as, as well. And then to, for them, they, they basically have like no chance of recovery. They, they, you know, Gabor cites one case in all of his hundreds of studies of a woman that actually got clean and had a turnaround. Um, I just think that you know, whatever horrors they, they experienced as children were, are, are insurmountable, you know? So <laughs> hopefully I answered your question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's really, um, I guess, in a sense, sad, the, like the trauma and stuff that does happen to us as a child and as we grow up. And I do agree that we have to sort of unravel that. And would you say like therapy has been a good catalyst for, your growth and a good place to unravel all your emotions and trauma. I mean, absolutely. I've, you know, I have tried everything. I have tried plant medicine. I have tried therapy. I have gone on so many retreats. I have done umpteen workshops. Uh, it's, it's all contributed to my healing and my growth. I, I have, probably done 20 years of therapy and um, probably could use some more, you know, I'm not currently in therapy, but I, I love, um, I love, I love learning and I love self exploration and I want to always come to understand myself in a deeper way, you know, and at some point, maybe, maybe at some point, um, just that internal reflection, just that, you know, just meditating, you know, people have always told me, they're like, Megan, you're always looking for answers outside of you and you have all the answers inside of you. So maybe, maybe if I could just sit and meditate for an hour every day, that'd be cool. <laughs> maybe that's a bit of <laughs> advice for me as well. <laughs> um, you were going to um, ask me about the sugar thing, right? Yeah. So what do you, what are your, what's your view on sugar? 
Well, I, my most recent blog was called nutrition and addiction and five foods that you need to avoid. And, uh, sugar is obviously number one. I'm super addicted to it right now. And I actually noticed that ever since I wrote the blog, I, my sugar increased somehow. Um, I, of course the same places in our brain light up from, you know, cocaine or heroin and, um, and sugar. And, uh, I'm about to do a cleanse. I'm about to do a candida cleanse for 45 days. So I'm going to be completely, completely off sugar. And I've likened it to being addicted to drugs and alcohol. I mean, I can't control it. I literally, you know, find myself like going to the gas station to buy gummy bears like in the same way that I would go to the liquor store to buy a bottle of wine, you know, I'm like, I'm not going to turn. I'm not going to turn. And like my car just starts turning by itself to go get me some sugar. So I, you know, I, I don't want to be trading one addiction for another. And I think that things like, you know, in AA meetings, they're always like smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee and eating sugar. And I used to poo-poo those things, but I think that they're a good place placeholder. You know, they're meant to kind of like step in and be the placeholder for a period of time. And then obviously as we evolve on our path, we want to become healthier and healthier. We can dial our nutrition more and more and more. And I'm, you know, I'm ready to be letting go of sugar. Like I don't want to be holding an extra 30 pounds and, you know, it makes you feel like crap. It's another way of kind of keeping you asleep and making you feel like a zombie. And, um, I just want to be completely like clean in my body, mind and spirit. Yeah, that's really awesome. And I guess I've recently, um, yeah, been on a sugar retreat, um, with one of my guests actually who came on the podcast, he invited me along to his sugar retreat and I, was sort of blind to that. I used to walk to the bottom of my road to smoke a joint every day and that was a big problem. And then after I solved that addiction, I would then walk to the top of my road to get some chocolate. And I was like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Um, so I went to yeah this sugar retreat and really yeah, sort of reprogrammed my mind a bit and we watched some documentaries and learned some really good tools in order to yeah sort of overcome my sugar addiction. And it's been... I went last weekend, so it's been like a week now of withdrawals. I'm coming to like the last few day, days of withdrawals from sugar, and it's been really good. What were your withdrawals like? They were okay. Um, I had, um, I quit cigarettes as well at the same time, so I had kind of both going on. <laughs> um, but they were good. Um, no, they weren't good, sorry. <laughs> they were strong, but they were, yeah, they were manageable. It was all, like, whenever I ate food, my belly would be full, but my body would be like, I need some sugar, I need some sugar. Right. So I would always feel feel hungry. So I'd have to use right. my meditation to be like, right, this is just a thought of me being hungry. I'm not actually hungry. Um, and then let that go and understand that I was full and use what... So you're meditating through your cravings. Yeah, yeah, and using what this, uh, my previous guest would call, Chris Hill, his name is, he'd call self-talk, where you just recognise that voice, you go, okay... I understand that you want me to go to get some chocolate, but I don't need chocolate. I'm only eating essential foods and non-sugar foods, and that's okay. And, you know, just be nice to him. Like, cool, you know. You, I know you want chocolate. You I understand that. that. Yeah. Yeah, it's really <laughs> beneficial. For yeah. sure. And it's almost well. like not being so punishing as well, because I think as addicts we can be extremely punishing, um, almost to the point where we use, and then it creates that perpetual cycle. So just like mm-hmm. forgiving yourself and just being nice to that voice and just saying like, I understand you. I know why you want sugar, but that's not, that's not you anymore. You're letting that go and you're eating nice healthy foods to so have some like grapes or some like something nice. And then. Oh, you're letting yourself have um, fruit sugar? Yeah. So yeah, I've mm-hmm. only on this retreat, we only sort of stopped refined sugar. It's not like complete sugar completely. It's just refined sugar. Just refined sugar. Yeah, on this cleanse I'm doing, I can have very like low glycemic berries, you know, blueberries or raspberries, but that's it. Yeah, I think no, that's, none of the tropical fruits. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things that I find really hard. Is one, it's like a progress addiction. You still have to eat something, and two, mm-hmm. like I don't know, like I've never really looked for sugar. It's so hard to know what's in sugar, what's not. Um, so it's really hard to navigate. But I guess I've just also not had like. Got to read your labels. Yeah, I've been reading lots of labels, but not having things that are like 
fruit juice because that's like um, like more more of a free sugar that can run around your body and it's more addictive. But if you have sugar that's not refined that has like substance and you're eating it like an apple, it's got more fiber, so it's like slow releasing and it's not as bad for you. That's my kind of education on it so far. Great. And how long have you been off sugar? Yeah, just about eight days or something. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Yeah. So cool. I'm totally going to try your method of yeah. meditating yeah, listen, through the cravings and yeah, talking to yourself. Yeah, and listen to the episode with Chris Hill of the podcast. Um, I will. And, yeah, his one's really good, and he talks about that. It was his retreat. Um, but in terms of if you could give some people like any tips that you got that helps you recover, what would they be? Any of like the key things? Oh gosh. I mean, I think ultimately I, I, I honestly felt like it was grace that stepped in. It was something bigger than me that, that, you know, got me into, um, a good rehab that brought really kind of angels into my life that, that were like enough, you know, um, I was clearly miserable. I mean, everyone knew that I was struggling. It was not, I was not one of these people that was good at hiding out. I was like messy Megan. And, um, my daughter too was instrumental. My daughter looked at me one day and she was like, mama, if you don't get sober, I'm not going to be in your life anymore. And that was it. That was really, uh, that was a turning point for me. I wasn't willing to, um, to lose my daughter, you know, over it. And, um, I can't even talk about it without getting a little emotional. Um, even though she's being so noisy in the corner over there right now. Um, um, so it was like this, you know, combination of, of forces really. It felt like something bigger than me. Like I said, it felt like grace stepped in and, and that, this higher power really was like, you know, it's, it's time and put the, these people, places and things in my life to, uh, to make it possible, you know? And, and it was this internal sense of, of readiness too. It was just like, you know, day after day of misery, um, and knowing that something else was possible, you know, and, and having had some, experience with sobriety you know I'd, I'd, I'd had a month or two here and there um and several times had like six months um so it felt it always sort of felt like an, an inevitability but I also um was so attached to this part of myself that I knew as the party girl you know there was like my whole persona it was built around this party girl image that like knew how to go out to really nice dinners and, um, drink like the tiniest bubble type of champagne that you could find and, um, lead what I thought was the good life. You know, and that was like, I had all these like associations in my head about, um, that. And, uh, you know, I'd say I'm still kind of like melting and distilling, um, down who, who I really am. You know, I, I don't have a, I don't have a lot of fun in my life anymore. I haven't really yet learned how to have fun in sobriety. I've been to a couple of parties where I, where, where there was like some really good EDM and I was able to like let go and have fun. Um, but on a regular basis, I'm not having fun or excitement in my life. I've kind of like this, this is like boring version of myself. I don't date. Um, and I lead a pretty quiet life. So I look forward to, you know, when that kind of comes like a little more full circle. And everyone says that when you get a year, it's kind of this big magical shift that happens. So that will be a huge, um, mile marker for me. That'll be a, like a big achievement, you know, I've been working up to this year for some years now because I've gotten really close, like, but never quite gotten there. So I, I feel, I feel optimistic that, uh, that it will happen this time. I'm, I have no desire to go back to, you know, where I was. It's basically 
it's such a clear cut choice. It's like your life can either incrementally get better or it can get worse. There's no, you know, you get sober, your life gets good. Don't you get unsober and your life's going to get shittier and shittier and go down lower and lower. So I think I'll opt for it. <laughs> yeah, choose to go up. And I would kind of agree with the fun part of what what you said in the sense that um, yeah, it's hard to sort of have traditional fun or what you were used to as being fun. But I think for me, it's yeah. almost kind of exchanging fun for fulfillment, you know, for like deeper levels of emotion and connection rather than what you'd call fun, you know, low level connection being on a drug with someone as opposed to like deep, meaningful conversations. And that kind of has helped me redefine what fun means and kind of, yeah, cash it in, if you like, for more around fulfillment. Very wise, Luke. Yeah, I mean, also <laughs> another thing that I was thinking about from what you said is, you know, like I would associate or used to associate as a stoner, if you like, that's like a big part of your identity. You smoke weed and that's who you are. Um, and I think part of my journey was learning that, you know, these labels that we attach to ourselves, yeah, they're stuck on with Velcro. They're not, they're not sewed on and we can take them off and we can choose new ones. And we can learn, I think, spiritually to not have any, just to accept I am full stop and just not to have any label at all and just accept yourself. Although it's obviously a lot harder um, and easier said than done, I think that's kind of the ultimate goal. Um, and I've also said to people on the podcast before that, you know, our dependencies are almost a journey, like a stop off on our journey to becoming our true self or our best self. And that's just, yeah, that's just part of it. And then again, our, our what? Um, our, our dependencies are almost a stop off on our journey to becoming our true self or our best self. Um, and yeah, I think that's what it's really about is yeah, growing and like you say, going up and not down and understanding those differences. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I am is one of these, you know, spiritual concepts, just I am. I have a book on my shelf. I am that by Sri Niskar Dada, and that's that. That is just it. I am is enough without anything to follow that. I am that. I am. Yeah, and I think going back to meditation, that really helps ground me in that ideology, if you like, the fact that you are not your thoughts and you have thoughts. Understanding you're an observer of all this stuff. So how do you really have an identity? when you're just an observer of these thoughts, they're just thinking about this label or something. So that really is like a practical way of grounding my training in sort of managing my identity and embracing change and stuff. Like the meditation, if you like, is a foundation of all my growth because it's about controlling that separation between who you are and what you think. Um, yeah. yeah. But yeah, run over. <laughs> But, um, What's that? I said, yeah, ran over. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, but what, um, well, you have a lot of good things to say. Yeah, no, you just really got me thinking about how everything's been on my journey. And, yeah, it's been a really nice conversation. Um, I really appreciate you putting me on the podcast, Luke. No, Thank it's you. It's amazing. I really like your blog. I'll continue to follow it. Where can people find out more about it and read about it? Okay. Yeah, so how can they sort of find out more about oh. your blog? How can people find more of what? Of your blog and what you're doing. Of my blog. Oh, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna launch my website. I've got the URL meganstarks.com, and um, my Facebook page is called My Naked Heart. So, I mean, that's basically my tagline is My Naked Heart. Um, and so, I guess Megan Starks on Medium right now is cool. <laughs> okay, awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, that's it. Thank you so much. No, thank you. It was really nice to yeah, have a chat with you. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Luke. Bye. Okay, bye.